Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Neil Siegel, and on behalf of the program in public law here at Duke Law School, I want to welcome you to today's event in which Barry Friedman will be discussing uh, his new book, uh, The Will of the People, How Public Opinion Has Influenced the Supreme Court and Shaped the Meaning of the Constitution. Uh, Barry Friedman is the Vice Dean and Jacob D. Fuchsberg Professor of Law at NYU Law School. Uh, he is a very prominent <coughs> constitutional scholar uh, whose work covers the areas of constitutional theory, constitutional history, as well as the study of judicial behavior. Uh, he's also a prominent federal courts scholar. Uh, his work is uh, uh, quite interdisciplinary, and uh, he's uh, just as much uh, a presence at conferences on legal history and political science as he is in constitutional law. Um, he is uh, engaged in a range of professional and <clears throat> service activities, including extensive involvement with the American Judicature Society. Uh, he's on the steering committee of New York University's Institute for Law and Society, as well as the director of the Furman Program, which is devoted to preparing young scholars for academic careers. Uh, in my own judgment, as well as that of, uh, of many constitutional lawyers, uh, Barry has written himself quite uh, a book. Um, in it, he takes the long view of American history, and he explains how the institution of judicial review uh, was made safe <coughs> for democracy in America. His story is exhaustively researched, beautifully written, scrupulously nonpartisan, and frequently quite humorous which is not a surprise once you get to know the author. Uh, I am presently assigning this book to my, uh, my first year constitutional law students, uh, both as fodder for theoretical ruminations as well as uh, what I hope and what I, what I, what I regard as, uh, as a, a very accessible as well as enjoyable way uh, to instill in law students the kind of historical perspective that I think is required in order to, to, teach, uh, to teach the subject. Uh, Barry will speak to us for roughly, roughly 20 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of opportunity for your questions and comments. And I see many of my students here uh, who are reading the book, and so I hope you will, will take this opportunity to engage uh, with the author about his text. Uh, without further ado, uh, Barry, welcome, welcome to Duke. Thanks. Tom. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Neil for inviting me. We've been friends for a, a good long time, and uh, I was thrilled to hear that he was uh, assigning the book to his class, so I gather a number of Who's reading it now? Who's reading part of it? Lots of you. What's wrong with everybody else? Uh, so so uh, here's what I thought I'd do, and I want to do it. Uh, it's sort of hard to pace this, because uh, I know you're looking at part of it. I don't know if you have the overall theme, but I want to talk a little bit about the thesis. I'm going to bust you through the history really fast, since I gather uh, you've got an idea of a chunk of it, and then talk about what I think all of this should mean to us, uh, including perhaps in, in current times. And I'd, I'd love to answer questions. Uh, you know, when I first started talking about the book, when it first came out, I needed a hook uh, to get people interested. And I would often point out that, obviously, Sonia Sotomayor had just taken the court, and that uh, there actually, over the last, you know, since the end of the Warren Court, there had been a lot of uh, appointments of Republicans uh, or appointments of justices by Republican presidents, and very few by Democrats, and still Republicans were often very dissatisfied with where the court was on hot button issues like abortion or affirmative action. Uh, and that was sort of my hook. But since then, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of stuff's happened. So we got the Citizens United decision, uh, uh, which sort of opened up politics to corporate money for electioneering activities. We got President Obama and uh, the Chief Justice and Justice Alito going at one another a little bit about uh, the Citizens United decision. We have health care reform, which was monumental, uh, and more regulatory reform on the way. The reaction to that has been a number of lawsuits by a number of states uh, challenging the constitutionality of aspects of health care reform, including the individual mandate, which I'd be glad to talk about. And so now we're living in the cycle of what the book is about. It's a history of the relationship between popular opinion from 1776 to 2005, when Chief Justice Rehnquist passes away and Sandra Day O'Connor leaves the court. Uh, and because this particularly is an academic audience, I'll explain sort of the framing. This book was written against the claim that you hear a lot of in law school and in the legal academy, that when the court does something, when the justices act in the name of the Constitution and invalidate what government has done, that they're 
acting contrary to the will of the people, that there's actually a democratic legitimacy problem. The way the story goes is uh, you have representatives, they're elected, they do things, and then these unaccountable nine justices strike them down. How do we explain that in a democracy, what in the academy is called the counter-majoritarian difficulty? Well, you hear that same claim, and you have heard that same claim since 1800, roughly. Uh, it is what is always leveled at the court when people are unhappy with what the justices are doing. And I wrote the book to make the point, uh, which the title is intended to convey, and if not, certainly the subtitle of the book, which is very, very long, uh, that the court is accountable to the public. It's always been accountable to the public. Uh, and therefore, it has some constraint on it. And in fact, in modern time, though I don't claim that this is true, uh, forever. In modern times, it is often the case that on the salient issues over the hall of time, the court and public opinion tend to come in line with one another. So that's the thesis. But mostly it's a history. And to understand the history, I divided it up into four parts, which I just want to summarize for you briefly so everybody in the room, even if you haven't looked at the book, gets an idea of the thesis, and then we'll talk about what it means. So the first period in history I call independence, and it's the period that runs from 1776 to 1800. So judicial review, this idea that judges have the power to strike down what uh, other individuals do in government in the name of the Constitution, is largely an American invention. Not entirely, uh, but it made sense in terms of the American Constitution. We have a written Constitution. It's intended to embody the will of the people. So if government agents are unfaithful, then the judges would hold them accountable by saying, you've wandered past what the Constitution permits. And uh, this idea, always controversial when exercised, nonetheless, it grabbed really quickly. I mean, surprisingly quickly, it took hold. The framers of the Constitution adopted in the Constitutional Convention as the way of keeping state courts and states in line with the federal Constitution. More complicated about the other branches of the federal government. Glad to talk about that, but clearly the intent with regard to the states. Uh, and everything goes along pretty well until 1800. And in 1800, what happens, as most of you know, is that the country divided into political parties, which the framers abhorred and hoped to avoid, the Federalists and the Republicans, they're at war with each other. The Republicans thump the Federalists in the election of 1800. They take both houses of Congress. There's a messiness about who's going to be the next president, but Thomas Jefferson is the answer. The Federalists pack the federal courts quickly with Federalists there to, as Jefferson saw it, strike down the work of the Republicans. Uh, and angry about this, one of the first things that the Republicans do is they uh, eliminate an entire set of courts created by the Federalists and throw out all of these Article III judges. You might have thought that was a problem under the Constitution. Then, because there might have been a constitutional problem with that, they cancel the Supreme Court's term for the next year, so the Supreme Court can't deal with the issue. And then when the court finally does deal with the, the issue, plus another little pending matter called Marbury versus Madison, uh, the court basically upholds the dismissal of all those judges, but reads Thomas Jefferson a lecture about his conduct in Marbury versus Madison. Jefferson's not very unhappy, and so the next move is to impeach sitting Supreme Court justices, starting with Samuel Chase. The period ends, I argue, in a tacit deal at the end of the tr Chase trial in the Senate, the deal being this. Chase is acquitted. Judges are given their independence, but only so long as they refrain from engaging in active partisan politics from the bench. And that deal, I argue, largely has stuck. You may have an exception in mind, the case that cannot be named. Uh, but other than that, the deal has largely stuck. The second period, which runs from sometime in the 1800s around then until about the 1830s, 1840, is the period of defiance. So what the justices learn right away is independence is not the same thing as power. That even though you're left alone, it doesn't mean anyone's going to listen to you. So regularly throughout this period, the Supreme Court is active. Uh, and mostly what it's doing is what the framers thought it would do, which is it's patrolling state action to make sure that it's consistent with the Constitution. And the states would do something. They'd get out of hand. The Supreme Court would strike it down. But when the Supreme Court did that, sometimes the states listened and sometimes they didn't. Uh, there was a lot of defiance. They didn't even want to treat the court as the boss of us, as the arbiter of these constitutional questions. There's a case in which uh, the court takes uh, grants review of a case, uh, or takes review over a case, and the state sends commissioners to negotiate with court, like it's sort of a foreign ambassador or something. Uh, there's a stunning instance. The country is in the middle of a large dispute about the removal of the Cherokee from Georgia. I'm sure you know about that. Uh, and in the middle of that dispute, Georgia uh, arrests and tries a fellow for murder, the murder having been conducted 
on Cherokee land. And he says the state of Georgia doesn't have jurisdiction over this case because it was conducted on tribal lands. And the case goes up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court takes it, it grants a stay, and Georgia executes him. The Georgia legislature passes a bill instructing the governor to execute him. The governor explains that the Supreme Court, so-called Supreme Court, has said not to do it, but we'll see how important they are, and they execute him. And this period comes to an end, I argue, or starts to come to an end, only when figures running the national government start to understand that they need the court. That, in fact, the court was put in place to help keep recalcitrant states in line. So what happens is Andrew Jackson's president, no fan of the judiciary, all in favor of removing the Cherokee from Georgia. Uh, but as this is going on, he's got a, a rear guard problem, which is that the state of South Carolina has nullified the federal tariff law, said it's unconstitutional. They've had a constitutional convention. They mustered troops. And they claim an independent right to interpret the Constitution. And uh, Jackson says, uh, in a couple of notable addresses, if there's a constitutional question, the body that's supposed to answer it is the Supreme Court. So that's a big switch. Gradually, we get used to this idea that defiance is not what you do when the Supreme Court decides cases. Uh, and things go along pretty well for a while, in part because Jackson gets a lot of more conservative or states' rights appointees, and so everybody's happy. Roger Taney, one of them. Uh, and then this country realizes it's got a major problem, which is, what do you do if you've decided to listen to the Supreme Court, follow what it says, and it does something really awful. So the really awful thing it does is it decides Dred Scott versus Sanford, and it basically disables the Congress from dealing with the issue of slavery. And the country's aghast. In an earlier era, what would have happened is you'd have heard lots of calls of defiance, but you don't hear them. Instead, in fact, you get interesting arguments about how the relevant parts are dicta, or it was a political question, the court shouldn't have decided it, but giving credence to the court. So the question is, well, what do you do with the court? And we enter into the third era, which I call the age of control, which is if you've got a court and it's going to say things and you're going to have to listen to them, then what you do is you do it, try as hard as you can to make sure it only says things you want to hear. So three times during the Civil War, Congress changes the size of the Supreme Court to make sure that we've always got a loyal court during the war. And at the end of the war, in a moment when Congress is reconstructing the South to bring the states back into the Union, and there's a moment where it looks like the court is poised to strike down Reconstruction as unconstitutional, Congress strips its jurisdiction. And the justices effectively bow to what they realize is a greater political power. And this era, I argue, runs until 1937, when Franklin Roosevelt threatens to pack the Supreme Court. You've probably been hearing a lot about that lately. 1932, Roosevelt's elected. Country's in the middle of a Great Depression. Uh, the New Deal Congress enacts measures. The Supreme Court strikes them down. The Congress enacts measures. The Supreme Court strikes them down. In 36, Roosevelt uh, runs a terrific race. He's elected by a landslide, huge margins in both houses of Congress and he proposes packing the court. He's got a veil for his measure, just like there's always a veil. He says that the justices are old and tired and there's a backlog. None of that is really true. But the idea is if he adds enough justices, then he knows his New Deal measures are going to get through. There's a huge fight in the country. It's hard to understand today how involved everyone is. The, the thing I can remember best that's sort of like this of a, as a constitutional matter was the Clinton impeachment. You know, I remember during the Clinton impeachment, if I went to get my hair cut, the person cutting my hair had a very complicated view of what the Constitution meant and what the president was probably triable for. And it was sort of like that. Newsreels, PTA meetings, debates in the newspaper, big radio shows. And at the end of that, the public turns thumbs down on the court packing plan and it fails, but not before, as you all know, the court flips, capitulates, and indicates it's not going to stand in the way of New Deal measures. And that, I argue, brings us into the modern era, the era in which we live now. How do things work in the modern era like this? The public likes an independent judiciary. The story against the New Deal uh, court packing plan was that we needed an independent judiciary to protect individual rights, constitutional rights, minority rights. It even is OK with judicial supremacy that when the court says something, the other branches of government follow along but only so long as the court stays tolerably within the mainstream of public opinion. And then the last few chapters of the book, the ones you probably would enjoy the most because they look like current times, go through the debates over women's equality, affirmative action, the death penalty, gay rights, federalism, name it, to show how over the run of time, the court's decisions come into line with popular opinion. Which brings us to the conclusion. So I ask or talk about three things in the conclusion of the book, and I think they're the right things to think about. The first is, 
Uh, okay, so if you're one of these people that was worried that the court's going to interfere with public opinion, it's going to trump the will of the majority, interfere with the elected representatives, you could relax somewhat. Doesn't look like that's what happens historically. But you might then start to worry about that other role that we hear about for the Supreme Court, the one that involves protecting minorities, protecting constitutional rights, safeguarding the Constitution, because there's a question that the book definitely asks about the capacity of the court to do that, and particularly the capacity of the court to do it against an aroused public. And the example I use in the book is the Korematsu case, the internment of over 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II with virtually no evidence of disloyalty. And the court has the issue uh, and nonetheless upholds the detention. Not my image of a court that's there to safeguard liberty at the time when you probably need it the most. So then the second question is, so how should we feel about judicial review? And to answer that question, we have to take a sub-question, which is, well, how does all this work? You know, how much freedom does the court have to interfere with the will of the majority? And I talk about, well, why does it do this in the first place? I mean, if you stop and think about it, it's weird, right? What, it, we are living in this odd time where very often the most majoritarian body in our government is the Supreme Court. That, that would have surprised the framers a little bit. Uh, and so why does it happen? And I go through a lot of different reasons, which I reject pieces of them, the appointments process. Some of them just like to be liked. Uh, and I argue that the lesson we can draw from history, the most important lesson, is that the courts learn the same thing that I just told all of you. They've seen justices impeach the court pack jurisdiction, strip budgets cut. Uh, there was one moment of peak at which the government was really mad at the Supreme Court. And so when they raised everybody else in government salaries, they didn't raise the Supreme Court justices just to show them. They get it. You know, They get that they're not invulnerable, that they are, in fact, the least dangerous branch. And so they're cautious in some ways about what they do. Now, that probably gives them more freedom to act than anything I've said so far would suggest, or even what the court does. I talk about the court being on a uh, leash or a bungee cord. You know, They can get wander away quite a bit until they get yanked back into line. Uh, but that's the idea. Uh, and then finally, I say, so OK, if that's the idea, I'm not sure how long that leash is. Besides, there's one other thing I want to say about the leash, which I guess is really, really important. Because people always say to me, well, what about an independent judiciary? And I say, I care about that, actually. That's the whole point. That's part of the point of the book. But you've got to remember, people like the independent judiciary when it's doing things they like. And they don't like it so much when it's doing things they don't like. And it keeps switching back and forth between sort of the left and the right throughout history. right? So I say. At the very, 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 very end of this long book, if you've gotten that far and haven't just left it on a train somewhere. Um, so how should we think about judicial review? What, how should we feel about it? You know, It's not going to always be able to protect minorities and constitutional rights. Doesn't always trump the will of the people. What does it do? And I make the argument that, in fact, the most important thing that the court does is that because constitutional decisions are sticky, it's hard to change them when they get decided. That's why everybody gets mad at the Supreme Court. You've got to amend the Constitution, hard to do. You've got to convince the justices to change their mind, hard to do. Some of the justices have to leave the court. Happens occasionally. Because those decisions are sticky, what happens is that they mobilize us as a country around their decisions, forcing all of us to debate what the Constitution means in constitutional terms. And I am not, and I want to be perfectly clear, in favor of the notion that it would be a great thing to have a Supreme Court that always followed the will of the people. But if what happens is the court decides things, there's a movement, there's a debate. It goes on for a period of time. Think of the 20 years between Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And at the end of that, the court comes into line with what I call in the book the considered judgment of the American people, then I can probably buy that role for judicial review. So that's how I end, and that's how I'm going to end. Uh, and I don't know how you want to do this, but I'm glad to answer any questions anybody has, unless they're from you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> I may or may not answer it. <laughs> In that case, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to end now. So, would, you, would you prefer to, to call on folks, or would you prefer for me to, to take that? I'm, I'm happy to do it. Any, All right. I'll, I'll call on people. Great. Is that, that was the only question? That's the only question. <laughs> I'll call on people. <laughs> Who's got a question? I thought the woman in the middle had a question because she was looking away like she had a question. But go ahead. I'm just yeah. wondering from a sort of a methodological <clears throat> standpoint, like how confident you are that the newspaper, uh, newspapers that you cite and things like that uh, represent actually the sort of majority 
public view at the time? Like, were you concerned about <coughs> that at all as you were putting it together? I mean, t hugely, right? I, uh, uh, I try to get hold of the best evidence that I can get hold of. As you've seen, since you know that much, there's all kinds of different evidence, but a lot of it is newspapers. A polling gets prominent at one point, but uh, you know, I think polling's problematic in, in, in that it does tell you where folks are, but polls tend to construct us as much as letting us figure things out. Uh, so yes, I'm always sensitive to the fact. I'm always sensitive to the fact that we're a very diverse nation and, and broken into segments and there's not clearly one answer. As I say at the beginning, I think the one advantage that I had doing this that I realized after I'd been at it for a while is I'm looking back. And looking back, you can kind of see what the fight was about. You know, you get, can see the contours of it. We tend to be an adversarial nation. We like that sort of, whether it's Nightline or you know, what kind of sort of pro-con approach to things. And then looking back, you can tell who won, usually. I mean, the, the part I was most nervous about was the last chapter, because I felt it, I was a little close to it. But my publisher wasn't so keen on the idea of not writing that last chapter. So I'm like, oh, but I'm a historian. I have integrity. I can't write that. He's like, no, we have to sell the book. You have to write the last chapter. So that's what happened. <laughs> But, the, but, the, but, you know, so I did my best. I got newspapers from all over. I actually, to tell you the truth, it occurred to me at one point, this is silly getting newspapers from all over because the justices aren't reading all of these newspapers. You know, they're reading the hometown paper and the Washington, D.C. paper or something like that. But, but I, I do my best, but of course. Yep. Is that kind of leads into my question? Um, tell me, like, who you are, what year you are. Oh, sure. I'm a 1L. I'm a Professor Siegel class. How is he? <laughs> How's the book? <laughs> it's great too. <laughs> uh, but it, I mean, it, we're going with this theory that the Supreme Court is a, aware of public opinion and is trying to stay in line with it, um, perhaps consciously. That isn't there a concern that they might be influenced by certain media or things put to them? I'm thinking also. Specifically about the death penalty section, I was reading that this weekend, and I noticed it was interesting. It seemed like a lot of polls and such showed that a lot of public support for ending the death penalty at that time of Furman, um, but then the reactions to the decision was was so severe the other way. So, so I think there are two great questions there, not just one. Uh, one of them goes to. <clears throat> uh, how does this happen? And then particularly. Who are the justices listening to, right? And then the other is about the death penalty. And it's interesting, it, in, in all my time talking about the book, nobody's asked about that. And I'm not sure if I have an answer, but let me take a stab at something. So uh, how this works is really complicated. And I don't claim to have an answer. I say quite clearly at the end of the book, this is a research agenda. I mean, the one thing I'm passionate about is that the way we've thought about the Supreme Court as, uh, uh, in legal academy and often in society is just all wrong. Uh, and this whole idea that they're there and they're independent and they can do whatever they want and they're trumping the will of people is silly. And it's better to, to have a realistic view of what they do and then try to figure out how to feel about that and theorize about that. Uh, I think they're constrained. I think they know they're constrained. But they're not so constrained that they can't do things that are unpopular. They just did a big one on, in January. And, uh, and so they have room to roam. And so then the question is, well, how do they, what do they do in there? And you know, they're complicated stories you can tell. Neil Devins and Larry Baumer, a law professor and a political scientist who have written an article explaining that the Supreme Court listens to elites, not everyday people, to which my reaction sometimes is, uh, well, my flip reaction is to want a bumper sticker that says, elites run the world, get over it. Uh, the less flip answer is to say, yeah, but the elites who run the world hold their jobs because they're good at reflecting what the rest of us think at some level. Uh, but justices have priors. They check them against circumstances. They reach conclusions. You know, We could talk a lot more about that. I think it's an interesting question. Uh, the death penalty. So it, you know, that's a good testing ground for some of this because you know, the signals were there that people, that it was a tipping point, that they could take some action about the death penalty. And people were discomfited by the death penalty. There are a lot of racial concerns about the death penalty. And the court did it. Uh, and there was this huge blowback, right? It was like, oops. And they backpedaled as fast as they could. And they've been backpedaling since at some level. Um, I mean, there have been opportunity areas where they've curtailed the death penalty. But by and large, they've been caught in this machinery of death, as Justice Blackman said, that they don't want to be in. Um, you know, maybe the voices they were hearing were elite. The intelligentsia. Uh, 
and then they kind of heard what the common person thought. I think, though, another reason, another better way to think about it, uh, and again, off the top of my head, I can't say for sure, is that it, that's my whole point about fostering public dialogue. That's a crystallizing moment. You know, everybody's kind of getting there, and then the Supreme Court decides this, and everybody sees what that looks like, and they go, <clears throat> excuse me, whoa, that is not what we want. Uh, and then they, at some level, really start to think about it. And so I think Supreme Court decisions, for better or worse, can do this. Yeah. What do we think the long-term significance of constitutional theory is in relation to your thesis? I mean, if the, if the primary thing that constitutional law tracks roughly is public opinion, and I guess what's, what's, what's the significance of the fact that public opinion, I guess, in a direct sense is not like one of the acceptable forms of making an argument about constitutional law when, it's, when it may be the most important thing that actually drives it? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. And I guess to answer it, I think what I'd want to do is divide theory into two or three categories. So one is <clears throat> purely legal interpretive theory. Should you be an originalist or should you be a living constitutionalist? It's great to talk about and write about. I don't know what I think of that theory. The one thing I think for sure about that theory is none of the justice, almost none of the justices are listening to it. And I actually think none of the justices are listening to it. Or maybe one justice is listening to it and not the one you think. So, uh, so, so that's, you know, that's that. Uh, it's, it's a weird thing that happened in the academy. I mean, this is being pretty candid with everyone. But the, we all wanted to be theorists. You know, we used to just be lawyers and legal thinkers. And then we wanted to be theorists. Because after all, there were all these other buildings in the university. And they had theorists in them. And so we wanted to have some theorists too. Uh, and so we wanted to theorize everything. But at some level, if you're a constitutional scholar or somebody that does, as Noah Feldman says, constitutional studies, uh, I think you know, you're also partly an advocate. So I think constitutional theory that's about issues that matter, that writes about not just interpretive theory, but you know, how should we think about equal protection, societal discrimination, uh, uh, the war powers. You know, that's, we have a lot of training in that. It's important to talk about that stuff. And so maybe folks should talk more about the merits unselfconsciously and less about sort of how judges are going to decide cases because they're not going to listen anyway. Uh, the third thing I want to say, though, and I think it's really important, and I think Neil and I feel deeply about this together, he's got training and I don't, uh, is, you know, sometimes in addition to knowing the law and having a legal theory, it helps to have some understanding of how the world works, to be positive uh, before you're normative, to be descriptive. And I think that to the extent that people are trying to learn some history and some political science and some psychology, to because, you know, what constitutional folks do is vitally important. It has a big impact on the world and the way people's lives are run and lived. And it's important to have some understanding of what the facts on the ground look like in order to draw conclusions about that stuff. Hey, Barry. Um, so I was interested in your idea of the Supreme Court kind of going out a little ahead and then prompting public debate. And then if, I think the idea is that public debate kind of comes in line. We sort of shouldn't be too worried about it. And I was wondering how, whether that's entirely uh, true. So um, what kind of full public debate really is there, in a sense, uh, when, first of all, I think people, most people have kind of a bias in favor of what's already been decided, some kind of status quo bias. So you don't have a full, so if you, particularly when, when you're told, this is how it's going to be, feel free to discuss. Uh, it's not entirely clear how much uh, full discussion you have. But particularly if you're told the Constitution requires X or Y, do we really have then a full ability to debate the policy or morality kind of aspects of something or does it, in fact, get shaped into a more narrow kind of a debate? So it may not be surprising that um, if the court goes out a little further than the majority, the majority just kind of comes in line as a matter of kind of acquiescing in the status quo, whereas if they had been asked originally what the right solution is, they might have actually come out the other way. Three parts of that I want to capture. The first part is I just want to be clear about something that um, it's true about me. My students know I like happy stories. I like happy endings. It's Sad but true. My wife and I go to a lot of romantic comedies and not too many horror films. Um, so you could be left at the end of the book <clears throat> with thinking I've, you know, I like a happier story more than than uh, deserves. Which is to say, only uh, I think there are winners and losers when the court decides 
things. I mean, Neil's got a wonderful idea about thinking about the Constitution in Kosian terms that, you know, you decide something and then you bargain around it and get where you want to go. But in the interim, you know, I mean, the Supreme Court says you can't ban child labor and there's a lot of kids that don't go to school and work in mills because they do that and it takes time to fix that. And Robert Bork and I agree about that. So that's something we agree on. Uh, the second thing is, where I think I disagree with you though, but I'm curious about it. I mean, I've had conversations, I had a long conversation uh, last night with folks about it, is the causality. So uh, I think that when the court decides things, mostly what happens is that the people who disagree are vocal, not the people who agree. In other words, I don't know that there's as much buy-in. I think when the court decides something and you already agree with it, you kind of nod and say, that's great, aren't they good? Uh, but it's the people who disagree who get mobilized and who ultimately push the game and change things. And so the death penalty is like a great example. I mean, that was hardly a conversation stopper. Either was Bowers versus Hardwick. Not that there wasn't damage done in the interim, but neither was Bowers versus Hardwick. So I think the causation more often goes to the court gets dragged into coming into line with public opinion. But I am willing to talk about and think about the extent to which court decisions also can move the American people. So one example I I, I'm often confronted with and I tend to agree about is Brown versus Board of Education. There are some political scientists who have worked overtime to persuade us that you know, court decisions don't have any effect in the real world and Brown is one that they give as an example. And they say, you know, nothing really happens until the Civil Rights Movement does it and the Congress does it and the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964. But you know, I can't believe that you can subtract Brown out of that story, that Brown didn't have an impact overall. The last thing I want to agree with though is that I do think that the way that decisions get rendered constraints. So here's a good example, Bakke, right? <clears throat> I mean, Bakke gets decided on the question of affirmative action. The court's 4-4 and Justice Powell's in the middle. And he says the only thing that's OK is diversity. So all of a sudden, diversity takes over as what we're going to talk about, even though there's all kinds of other values at stake in affirmative action. I mean, there's role model legitimacy issues, right? But it all gets framed in those terms. Uh, and in fact, Justice O'Connor writes an opinion uh, that seems like it's about diversity. Uh, in Grutter, even though I don't think that it is. Neil doesn't think that it is either, and so you may have just learned that it isn't. Uh, he's right. Uh, but so you're right that it affects the terms of the debate uh, unequivocally. How about the back of this room, all of you back there? Yes. Sure. Uh, <laughs> studies have shown that appointees to the Supreme Court by presidents tend to stay with whatever ideology the president was about three-fourths of the time. So if that's the case, and it's just one quarter of justices who are shifting someone on the court, is public opinion really doing most of that work? Or is the appointment process doing mo most of it and presidents just sometimes get it wrong? Uh, what was the very last part? I got everything up to the or, after the or. or do presidents, do appointments do most of the work and sometimes presidents just get it wrong when they appoint someone? Yeah, so I don't know what research you're thinking about, but I'll shout out Andrew Martin and Lee Epstein's uh, and others' wonderful work on ideological drift. I think it's, 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 it's a really neat study. Uh, and I think, you know, we've come a long way in trying to sort of place justices in ideological space and track what happened over the course of their career. Presidents have also gotten a lot better, right? I don't, I mean, there were, I don't know whether to call it a presidential, you know, Eisenhower said his two worst mistakes were on the Supreme Court. He meant Brennan and uh, Warren. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's Eisenhower being a little unfair in the following sense. He wasn't looking for somebody really far on the right. He wanted a state court judge who was a Catholic. He got one. That was Brennan. I mean, if that's what you go looking for, you know, you can get what you want. It's not hard to find it. Uh, and Lincoln would often say, you know, we can't ask a man, then it was a man, what, what he'll do once he's on the court, so we should just make darn sure before we put him there. Uh, and, you know, I think presidents get that, and they've gotten good at picking, and they've gotten a lot better. And this ideological thing's become really, really important. So I'm giving your question lots of credit, which is only making it worse for whatever it is I'm going to say right now. Uh, but I think what I want to say is uh, that two things. One is time is confounding. You know, John Paul Stevens has been on the Supreme Court for a very long time. And in fact, the terms are lengthening. And the series of issues that come to you change. Uh, the studies show you drift more later in life. Uh, and so that combination is going to uh, give you an effect that wanders off of what the president wants. I don't think it's just an appointments game. But the other thing I can, you know, is that, that uh, Boumediene, I mean, you know, the fun cases to pick are the ones where you can be pretty darn sure that the justices didn't vote the way that the people in power would have liked to have seen them vote. And so we're going to get those, right? And what's going on there? I think public opinion. Yeah. Um, this question 
question builds a little bit off of what you were saying earlier about um, how the just justices may or may not be really paying attention to the, the theories of originalism and um, living constitutionalism. And, and it really seems to me that a lot of the time they sort of say they're doing one thing but pick and choose what they're actually doing based on the results that they want. And I'm wondering if, um, <coughs> I mean, for, for a student of constitutional law, it's kind of, you know, we're reading these cases and we're thinking to ourselves, you know, how credible are these justices if that's what they're doing? And um, when it comes to the public, you know, a lot of lay, lay people don't really read the full opinions. They don't know what's going on. I'm wondering if you think that that's one of the reasons the justices think that they, they can do that, or if you think that um, the, the increasing availability of both Supreme Court opin opinions to the public is going to have an effect on that. Um, I just want to make sure I understand, what that, that is the failure to follow a theory like originalism, or? Yeah, I, I guess um, sometimes, yeah. More or less. I mean, I obviously they're, they're all um, not articulating myself very. No, I think you're doing terrifically. Uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm answering the. Yeah, that, the, I, that's. Yeah. So, so, so let me. I, ju I just want to say something about that was hidden in your question, but it, but I think it matters a lot, uh, and it matters a lot to say to law students. Uh, and then go right at that question, which is, you know, you do read the decisions, and there are five four, and five conservatives think one thing, and four liberals think another. And after you do that for a while, you start to go, hmm, this is law. Uh, and you know, that's the right thing to ask. But I actually, you know, my project, as a, purely in the most profound of academic ways, my project is in trying to understand how we integrate law and politics, because. Uh, you know, unless you think law is meaningless, and I don't, and unless you think the political scientists are all wrong about everything, and I don't, there has to be a story that brings them together, and it's not a story we try very hard to tell, and I think we need to start to do that. So that's me proselytizing. Uh, the, the, uh, now, so then, you know, there are these ways that you're supposed to interpret, you know, we should be an originalist. There's an answer to why uh, they don't, and no, I don't think they're going to start doing it, and the answer to that's really simple, because there's just, I mean, there is no way to approach a constitution and anything that a constitution is supposed to be in any sensible way without having a panoply of interpretive tools and trying to reach a sensible answer, okay? And original, I mean, I, I, I thank Neil for what he said. He asked me, is there anything I wanted him to say? And I said, no, but there's one thing he did say that I want to highlight, which is I really did try to write this book down the middle. I mean, it, it tries to be an account that is an equal opportunity taking shots at the left and the right and I'll take them here publicly, right? So originalism is bunk. I mean, it's, and actually that's the title of somebody else's article, I can't remember who, so I don't wanna, uh, it's Mitch Berman. It's just true. I mean, it's ridiculous. It is, it is completely ridiculous. You know, nothing about federal government control of the economy. Nothing about women's equality. I mean, you just can't get there that way. And so it, a Heller is not an originalist decision. If you think it, it is Justice Scalia's opinion about gun rights, go read it more carefully. It's a living constitution decision. On the other hand, people aren't buying that, oh, it's just a living constitution thing, and I don't blame them. It's like, oh, it just means whatever we want it to mean today. I mean, that can't be right, right? So how do you interpret a constitution? You're lawyers. You look at the text. You figure out what it is that the people who wrote it were trying to do. You look at that in context of the whole system of government. You then think about what we've done over time and how it all fits together and what makes good sense. You look at the world that we're living in today and you see what the impact is going to be. You do all that stuff and you do the best job you humbly can of reaching a conclusion. And then you don't get confused into thinking that every court's like the Supreme Court because they're not. The Supreme Court gets questions in equipoise, really hard questions that are balanced. And then all of the other courts follow what they say. And yes, ideology plays out there. I'd be the first to, to tell you that was true, but law plays out there in a big way too. And so don't confuse the court with the rest of all the just, uh, parts of the judicial system. Don't think that because there's aspects of politics, there's not a rule of law. I very much think there is, and I think it's really important to understand how that rule of law works. But you know, don't be naive about what they're doing, which actually says something, and then I'll turn to another question about thinking really seriously about put, who you put on that court. Because it is a very big and very important job, and it is a difficult job. And I very often think that the politics that surround it are very remote from the job itself, and that's unfortunate. Um, so if the court's tracking public opinion, I'm kind of wondering what the role is of groups like um, the ACLU or the Alliance 
defense fund that are going through the courts to try and create change, but specifically through the courts because they might not have the public support going through um, enacting legislation. I'm specifically thinking like the, le the litigation going on with Prop 8 in California. You know, is that just a futile enterprise? It's just, I don't know, I'm kind of wondering. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and it, you know, it reminds me of one thing I wanted to say about theory, which is, you know, I'm a believer in the academy. I've lived most of my life in the academy, and it's an extraordinary thing that we do as a, as a society, right, that we devote these huge amounts of money to places where people can just come think and have ideas, but it's because we have this belief that basic research will affect ideas and where we go. And so being a theorist matters because, you know, even if you're having theories that seem wacky now and whatever, I mean, eventually they cross over through some very odd process of osmosis into the real world, and some of them stick. Uh, and that's true of litigators, and it's true of public interest litigators and people doing impact litigation. I mean, you can fight a fight and lose and still make a point, right? People still are educated by the fact that you fought the fight. You might even educate them enough that they come around to seeing what you think. The courts are a forum for political action, social action, just like every other forum. And so I don't, I don't see them as airtight. Uh, I think that what happens in one influences the other. Uh, and uh, that's my whole idea about this dialogue, right, which is that you're going to have a conversation. So Prop 8 in particular, I mean, it's a fascinating case because I'm sure you all are, Prop 8's the trial going on in California about the uh, uh, banning of gay marriage and uh, challenging the constitutionality of that popular, de uh, of that decision by referendum in California, and there was a lot of hysteria around bringing the suit because Ted Olson and David Boies brought it, and a lot of folks in the gay rights movement thought it was a huge mistake. And I actually think it was a huge mistake because uh, I don't think that's a fight that's ultimately going to be won until public opinion's ready for it to be won, and I don't think public opinion's there. And I think damage can be done along the way. And sometimes you have to do damage, you know? I mean, there are lots of cases, if you study the courts and judicial behavior, one thing you have to be aware of is selection bias, like, because you think, well, people won't bring cases that won't win, but you know, if you're sentenced to death, you bring like every claim you possibly can because the stakes are really high, right? But some cases you don't have to bring. Yeah. Um, if justice is due. Die in the middle, yeah. <laughs> if justice is due, employ these factors that you, uh, if all do employ these factors that you elaborated a little bit earlier, um, why isn't this more transparent? Why the smoke and mirrors of things like, uh, of uh, theories like originalism? Um, and why isn't the language uh, that the court employs more accessible to the public, more digestible? Um, and can you, can you just address yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, so, I mean, there's a lot of transparency. They take cases, there are oral arguments, you can listen to them on IES, they issue opinions, you can see them on the net almost instantly, we have SCOTUS blog, everybody in the public isn't watching, but then we have policy, policy entrepreneurs, you know, talk radio hosts, people who let the public know what's going on. So I think there's lots of transparency to the process. But you do raise two questions in different directions. One is, so why all this talk of originalism or living constitutionalism? Well, you, you know the answer by now, right? It's because there's, there's a war on about the meaning of the Constitution. That's OK. There's been a war on about the meaning of the Constitution since we started. There should be a war on about the meaning of the Constitution. It's the way that we as a society debate our most fundamental values. And so it's serious stuff. Uh, and it just was almost a historical artifact in the 1980s that that war, which had been about substance, became to be about interpretation. It's because the kinds of issues that was facing the court, death penalty, women's equality, uh, were the kinds of abortion, which the kinds of issues where the original Constitution seemed to run out. And the conservatives were appalled. And they thought, this is a way to explain the problem. And they were very effective. But when you read uh, Steve Tellis' book about the Federalist Society, or you read the small part of that account in my book, I mean, you can see how originalism is constructed. I mean, it is one of the things I'm a little sarcastic about in the book, which is they're having meetings in the Justice Department to think about how originalism should work. I mean, if it's what we've been doing for 200 some years, you don't really have to have a meeting to figure it out, right? You already know, but it was a strategy. So, th and it was a response to the left, because the left saw that these decisions were getting out there from the original Constitution and weren't sure what to do. And they, you know, moral philosophy was the answer. My colleague, Ronnie Dworkin. And so it was that, you know, we've got a living constitution. And so those are, that's political rhetoric. 
The last tiny thing I'll say is, nonetheless, Supreme Court decisions are awful to read right now. I mean, I just think they're terrible. Uh, and uh, having read several hundred years of them, there was a time when I feel like the texture of them just swam in line with the times. If you were living the time and you read the Supreme Court decision, it was part of the politics and time in which you were living. And for a variety of reasons that include word processing and law clerks and the <laughs> judicialization of the judiciary, you know, all we put on the court now are judges who were judges. It's all like, you know, Roman one, part A, facts, part, you know, and it's just, it's dreary to have to do this nowadays, but that's what I do. <laughs> so I have another transparency question, which is, um, if, even, if, even if you're completely right about your thesis, is this, some, is this something healthy for us to know? <laughs> um, and is, or is it one of those things where, um, you know, it's, it's, it's better if we think it operates some other way? Uh, so I was in my office one day uh, a bit before the book came out, and it was late in the afternoon, and one of my colleagues knocked on the door, uh, and he said, if I do this invitation well enough, you might even know who this is. He says, this is just a wonderful book. This is a terrific book. I wish you hadn't written it. Uh, and I looked at him and I said, I so understand what you mean. Uh, and it's just this question, right? I mean, I don't know how to answer it, having written it. Uh, uh, it would certainly help sell the book if everybody thought this is a book that was dangerous to read, right? <laughs> it's either that or put sex in it, and there isn't much. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, you know, it's the, is knowledge a bad thing? Is it ever a bad thing? Uh, I, I think I could ask you to explain why it might, why don't you tell us why you think it might be dangerous? I was going to offer your words, but. You know, the executive branch is responsive to the public, and so is Congress. The idea was that the court was supposed to offer us some other, uh, was based on some other authority that was going to check the excesses of the popular will. So it turns out. Um, and, and their respect depends upon that view of them. And so you take that away, and they're just another, um, you know, shill for some uh, what, whatever consensus the interest groups are willing to, are able to gin up. So, so I can, yeah, yeah, that's well said. So uh, I guess what I would say is let's be careful about the thesis of the book then. And the thesis of the book is that the court ultimately is constrained by public opinion that its freedom of movement is not unbounded, and that the story that the justices are some alien creatures plopped down from the planet Mars to tell the rest of us what to do is ridiculous. But they have freedom to move in that space. I'm quite clear about their freedom to move. Uh, sometimes I like what they do in that freedom. Sometimes I don't like what they do in that freedom, uh, but they have it. So that's one thing. And the other is I. Uh, I just, you know, I think it's fine if over time they come into line with the considered judgment of the American people. I think it's hard to understand the Constitution at some level ever, other than something that we manage to think consistently as a society for over a generation. Uh, but I certainly don't think that they ought to be following public opinion. I think it's nutty, and, you know, I hope they're not. But there are some examples of the fact that maybe they are, so seems like that's a tool to critique what's going on. And I'll just point out that I'm uh, not accepting silently your notion that the executive branch and the Congress are reflecting the will of the majority of the public. Do you see any tension between the part of your thesis that the court is a reflection of public opinion with the fact that the Supreme Court has unfettered discretionary power to on regarding which cases it decides to grant cert? Uh, no, I actually think it helps them manage that problem that may be troublesome in the sense that, uh, so the classic example of this, you know, as Alex Bickle pointed out in The Least Dangerous Branch, what he called the passive virtues was name versus name. So after Brown versus Board of Education, the question comes to the court, well, what about intermarriage? Are the laws banning intermarriage unconstitutional? And the court, you know, we now have the papers from that time, just duck it. They don't take the case. They just, they dispose of it. And completely disingenuously. And Bickle says, well, but that's OK, because they've only got so much power. He, at least in a younger Bickle, thought that the court could be an opinion leader, a prophet for the rest of the country. But it was like, well, you can't pull people where they're not going, and you can't pull them ahead of time. And so uh, this helps them manage that. 
Uh, it helps them. It, uh, it, it's a way that they, in fact, can manage their constraint. They just don't have to hear things that are going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, do you see that the ability of the court to um, just sort of uh, be in tune, as it were, with public opinion will be uh, diluted in the future or is even starting to be diluted now by the, um, the level of homogeneity, homogeneity in the background of the judges? And as you said, that they were all, you know, all of them were federal court of appeals judges. Uh, I think only Sotomayor, maybe Alito, was actually a prosecutor and no one really, except for Sotomayor, oversaw trials. Yeah, so I'm going to answer that question. I don't know when we end, but I, there's something I actually want to make sure I say. So uh, I'll, I'll at least prickle your thinking on this. So, um, you know, they do live in their own little bubble. It's not as big as some people might think. I mean, they do travel in the world, some of them more than others. They watch television. They read newspapers. They have friends who have views. Uh, I, I do think it's unfortunate. Some of them are friends who have views. I do think it's unfortunate that they... Uh, that we've gotten into this habit of picking judges, justices who are judges. And there's a reason why. It's because you can vet them. You know, the president can throw you on a court of appeals bench for a while and watch how you behave, or they've seen how you behave. Uh, and in fact, uh, Lee Epstein, uh, who's a political scientist and law professor at Northwestern, and Dick Posner, who's a federal judge and also a professor at the University of Chicago, uh, are working on a project um, about judicial behavior, but one part of it involves what they call auditioners. Can you predict the behavior of judges on the Court of Appeals who want to be on the Supreme Court? You know, how will they behave to get there? I think we've lost something profound by just putting those people on the court. Uh, I mean, this is my wackiest idea of the week. I understand every reason that this is wrong. Uh, he's white, he's male, he's too old, he's already got an important job in Congress, but I'd put, I'd put uh, Schumer on the bench, you know? Because I think he'd be a really interesting Supreme Court justice. And the reason I think he'd be an interesting Supreme Court justice is twofold. First, he's a good lawyer. You know, pe the people on the left say, oh, we need somebody who's a Scalia. I mean, you actually don't want somebody who's Scalia because he doesn't, can't make friends with everybody else on the bench. And so they can't get five votes for anything. And if you want to do anything, you want five votes, right? But you want somebody who's smart and persuasive and a good politician, meaning understand, I mean, will, you know, William Brennan is somebody for whom I, my respect has grown enormously over the course of my career. I mean, he was really good at putting together a majority on the court. And so you want to look for that person to be the justice, you know, somebody who's actually going to pull the court together while having the agenda that they want to pursue. And I think it helps a lot if they understand something about the world. So I'm actually a fan of Sandra Day O'Connor's. And I was a fan when she was doing things I didn't like. And I was a fan when she was doing things I liked because I thought she was smart. Not everybody thinks that. They will scoff about that. But she actually single-handedly rewrote federalism and habeas corpus law. So that was nothing minor. Uh, but she had this like magic barometer about where the American people were on things. And not, I think, in a bad way, but in actually a much more fundamental way. She understood, uh, she, you know, she understood what could be accomplished with affirmative action and its political limits. Uh, and so I think it would be great if we had more folks like that. I want to say something about the Roberts Court. Can I? Uh, so we have an interesting court, or we had an interesting court until January, and then it got a lot less interesting for me. Uh, and the reason that I think that it's interesting is because this court, you know, the story about the Roberts Court is that we've got this minimalist, gradualist court. And you watch, you know, John Roberts and Samuel Alito at their confirmation hearings talk about, uh, I mean, everybody gets nervous when the median justice is getting that seat's getting filled, right? The court could shift, you know, when Lewis Powell left in the Bork nomination or when uh, O'Connor retired and now we've got this empty seat. People get anxious about which way the court's going to be moving, as they should. Uh, and so what we saw was this sort of uh, sh charade about how we have referees and umpires and balls and strikes. But the other part of it that we saw was this, you know, stare decisis is really important. We're going to follow the law. And, uh, I remember I, I had a friend who's not a lawyer, was in New York, and ran into me on the street. And she said, I'm watching the hearings. What's the stare decisis thing they keep talking about? And I explained to her why everybody cared about it so much. Uh, and then the story about the Roberts Court was that they were gradualist and minimalist. And all that ended with Citizens United, which we could, you know, it, it may just be a blip, frankly. Uh, but you know what? This is a very clever court. This is the danger of the thesis, which is that this court understands this thesis of this book really well. And it has managed to move itself to the right as much as it possibly can and wants without rousing public attention. It's done it in a variety of ways. 
It's done it by cleverly picking cases where the facts are such that it's hard to disagree with the outcome of the case, and then they can write whatever they want in the opinion. It's claiming to be doing less than it is, so eschewing facial challenges for as-applied challenges that really are facial challenges. Uh, so they actually gutted that provision of campaign finance in a case before they ever got there. They're doing it by stealth overruling, by not admitting that they're overruling cases, but by not following it. And so I think this is a very, this, like they're writing the next chapter of my book for me. Now, Citizens United happened, and that one seemed pretty flagrant, and there was a lot of public pushback. So I, you know, I'm not claiming that this is the end of what's going on with the Roberts Court, but it is something I wanted to say, and I said it. Yeah? How does that affect, I suppose, the role of the executive? Because Obama called them out on that. I mean, I, I was reading an article in the Daily Beast, I think, about how he can win political points by going against the court because that decision is so unpopular. So is the role of the executive then to keep his eye on those subtle courts and to bring the public attention to what they're doing? Well, you know, it's, uh, we had a long debate at dinner last night. Dean Bartlett doesn't agree with uh, me about this. Uh, uh, and I'm sure she's right here at Duke, at least. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, I think it's the president's job to do this. I don't think it's the president's job to threaten justices in direct ways, but he's, as I said to somebody, he's the criticizer in chief. He's got the bully pulpit. I mean, uh, could you imagine Lincoln, you know, saying, oh, too bad about Dred Scott, but I shouldn't say anything about it. Uh, you know, or Franklin Rose, not, not to, Franklin, not to be too harsh, I should give you equal time, I feel like, because she makes a very good argument why this is wrong. Uh, but I just, I think that's the role. But you know, more importantly, far more importantly for all of you, is it's your obligation to say something about it, right? All of you. So I'm writing about criminal procedure. I've just started to write about criminal procedure. I've never written about criminal procedure in my almost 30 years of teaching law. I care deeply about it. I'm not sure why I've never written about it, because I do care so profoundly. I think the Supreme Court is completely unreliable to protect our liberties when it comes to things like the Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment. And so you know what I did? I read my book, and I thought, OK, this issue needs to be salient. So it's my job to do something about it. So I'm going to try to make the issue salient. And that's true for all of you. I mean, the Constitution is yours, you know? Get involved with it. It's really important. Seems like a great note on which to end, doesn't it? <laughs>